Angular Mala, Pali language, lit. Finger necklace is an important figure in Buddhism, particularly within the Theravada tradition. Depicted as a ruthless brigand who completely transforms after a conversion to Buddhism, he is seen as the example par excellence of the redemptive power of the Buddha's teaching and the Buddha's skill as a teacher. Angular Mala is seen by Buddhists as the patron saint of childbirth and is associated with fertility in South and Southeast Asia. Angulamala's story can be found in numerous sources in Pali, Sanskrit, Tibetan and Chinese. Angulamala is born a Himsaka. He grows up as an intelligent young man in Savathi, and during his studies becomes the favorite student of his teacher. However, out of jealousy, fellow students set him up against his teacher. In an attempt to get rid of Angulamala, the teacher sends him on a deadly mission to find a thousand human fingers to complete his studies. Trying to accomplish this mission, Angulamala becomes a cruel brigand, killing many and causing entire villages to emigrate. Eventually, this causes the king to send an army to catch the killer. Meanwhile, Angulamala's mother attempts to interfere, almost causing her to be killed by her son as well. The Buddha manages to prevent this, however, and uses his power and teachings to bring Angulamala to the right path. Angulamala becomes a follower of the Buddha, and to the surprise of the king and others, becomes a monk under his guidance. Villagers are still angry with Angulamala, but this is improved somewhat when Angulamala helps a mother with childbirth through an act of truth. Scholars have theorized that Angulamala may have been part of a violent cult before his conversion. Indologist Richard Gombrich has suggested that he was a follower of an early form of Tantra, but this claim has been debunked. Buddhists consider Angulamala a symbol of spiritual transformation, and his story a lesson that everyone can change their life for the better, even the least likely people. This inspired the official Buddhist prison chaplaincy in the UK to name their organization after him. Moreover, Angulamala's story is referred to in scholarly discussions of justice and rehabilitation, and is seen by theologian John Thompson as a good example of coping with moral injury and an ethics of care. Angulamala has been the subject of movies and literature, with a Thai movie of the same name choosing to depict him following the earliest sources, and the book The Buddha and the Terrorist by Satish Kumar adapting the story as a non-violent response to the global war on terror. Textual sources and epigraphical findings The story of Angular Mala is most well known in the Theravada tradition. Two texts in the early discourses in the Pali language are concerned with Angular Mala's initial encounter with the Buddha and his conversion, and are believed to present the oldest version of the story. The first is the Theragatha, probably the oldest of the two, and the second is the Angulamala Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Both offer a short description of Angulamala's encounter with the Buddha, and do not mention much of the background information later incorporated into the story such as Angulamala being placed under oath by a teacher. Apart from the Pali texts, the life of Angulamala is also described in Tibetan and Chinese texts which originate from Sanskrit. 
The Sanskrit collection called Samyuktagama from the early Mulasavastavada school, has been translated in two Chinese texts in the 4th-5th century CE by the early Savastavada and Kasyapiya schools and also contains versions of the story. A text translated in Chinese from the Sanskrit Akotara Agama by the Mahasamgika school is also known. Furthermore, three other Chinese texts dealing with Angulamala have also been found, of unknown origin but different from the first three Chinese texts. Apart from these early texts, there are also later renderings, which appear in the commentary to the Majjhima Nikaya attributed to Buddhahosa and the Theragatha commentary attributed to Dharmapala. 6th century CE. The two commentaries do not appear to be independent of one another, it appears that Dharmapala has copied or closely paraphrased Buddhahosa, although adding explanation of some inconsistencies. The earliest accounts of Angulamala's life emphasize the fearless violence of Angulamala and, by contrast, the peacefulness of the Buddha. Later accounts attempt to include more detail and clarify anything that might not conform with Buddhist doctrine. For example, one problem that is likely to have raised questions is the sudden transformation from a killer to an enlightened disciple. Later accounts try to explain this. Later accounts also include more miracles, however, and together with the many narrative details this tends to overshadow the main points of the story. The early Pali discourses Pali, Sutta, do not provide for any motive for Angulamala's actions, other than sheer cruelty. Later texts may represent attempts by later commentators to rehabilitate the character of Angulamala, making him appear as a fundamentally good human being entrapped by circumstance, rather than as a vicious killer. In addition to the discourses and verses, there are also Jataka tales, the Milandapana, and parts of the monastic discipline that deal with Angulamala, as well as the later Mahavamsa chronicle. Later texts from other languages that relate Angulamala's life include the Avadana text called Sataka, as well as a later collection of tales called Discourse on the Wise and the Fool, which exists in Tibetan and Chinese. There are also travel accounts of Chinese pilgrims that mention Angulamala briefly. In addition to descriptions of the life of Angulamala, there is a Mahayana discourse called the Angulimalaya Sutra, which Gautama Buddha addresses to Angulamala. This is one of the Tathagatagava Sutras, a group of discourses that deal with the Buddha nature. There is another sutra with the same name, referred to in Chinese texts, which was used to defend the Buddhist stance against alcoholic beverages. This text has not been found, however. Apart from textual evidence, early epigraphic evidence has also been found. One of the earliest reliefs that depicts Angulamala dates from approximately 3rd century BCE. Topic: <laughs> Story. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Previous incarnations. The texts describe a previous incarnation before Angulamala met the Buddha Gautama. In this life, he was born as a man-eating king turned Yaksha Pali, Yaka, a sort of demon, Sanskrit, Yaksa, in some texts called Saudasa. Saudasa develops an interest in consuming human flesh when he is served the flesh of a dead baby. 
When he asks for more, his subjects start to fear for their children's safety and he is driven from his own kingdom. Growing into a monster, Saudasa meets a deity that promises Saudasa can retrieve his status as king if he sacrifices 100 other kings. Having killed 99 kings, a king called Sutazoma changes Saudasa's mind and makes him a religious man, and he gives up all violence. The texts identify Sutazoma with a previous incarnation of the Buddha, and Saudasa with a previous incarnation of Angulamala. According to the Akotara Agama, however, in a previous incarnation, Angulamala is a crown prince, whose goodness and virtue irritate his enemies. When his enemies kill him, he takes a vow just before his death that he may avenge his death, and attain nirvana in a future life under the guidance of a master. This version makes it look as though Angulamala's killing is justified. <laughs> Youth In most texts, Angulamala is born in Savathi, in the Brahmin priest caste of the Gaga clan, his father Bhagava being the chaplain of the king of Kosala, and his mother called Mantani. According to commentarial texts, omens seen at the time of the child's birth the flashing of weapons and the appearance of the constellation of thieves in the sky indicate that the child is destined to become a brigand. As the father is interpreting the omens for the king, the king asks whether the child will be a lone brigand or a band leader. When Bhagava replies that he will be a lone brigand, the king decides to let it live. Buddhahosa relates that the father names the child Ahimsaka, meaning the harmless one. This is derived from the word ahimsa non-violence, because no one is hurt at his birth, despite the bad omens. The commentary by Dharmapala states that he is initially named Himsaka the harmful one by the worried king, but that the name is later changed. Having grown up, Ahimsaka is handsome, intelligent, and well behaved. His parents send him to Taxila to study under a well-known teacher. There he excels in his studies and becomes the teacher's favorite student, enjoying special privileges in his teacher's house. However, the other students grow jealous of Ahimsaka's speedy progress and seek to turn his master against him. To that end, they make it seem as though Ahimsaka has seduced the master's wife. Unwilling or unable to attack Ahimsaka directly, the teacher says that Ahimsaka's training as a true Brahmin is almost complete, but that he must provide the traditional final gift offered to a teacher and then he will grant his approval. As his payment, the teacher demands a thousand fingers, each taken from a different human being, thinking that Angulamala will be killed in the course of seeking this grisly prize. According to Buddhahosa, Ahimsaka objects to this, saying he comes from a peaceful family, but eventually the teacher persuades him. But according to other versions, Ahimsaka does not protest against the teacher's command. In another version of the story, the teacher's wife tries to seduce Ahimsaka. When the latter refuses her advances, she is spiteful and tells the teacher Ahimsaka has tried to seduce her. The story continues in the same way. Life as a brigand Following his teacher's bidding, Angulamala becomes a highwayman, living on a cliff in a forest called Jalini where he can see people passing through, and kills or hurts those travelers. 
he becomes infamous for his skill in seizing his victims. When the people start to avoid roads, he enters villages and drags people from their homes to kill them. Entire villages become abandoned. He never takes clothes or jewels from his victims, only fingers. To keep count of the number of victims that he has taken, he strings them on a thread and hangs them on a tree. However, because birds begin to eat the flesh from the fingers, he starts to wear them as a sacrificial thread. Thus he comes to be known as Angulamala, meaning necklace of fingers. In some reliefs, he is depicted as wearing a headdress of fingers rather than a necklace. Topic: <laughs> Meeting the Buddha. Surviving villagers migrate from the area and complain to Pasanadi, the king of Kosala. Pasanadi responds by sending an army of 500 soldiers to hunt down Angulamala. Meanwhile, Angulamala's parents hear about the news that Pasanadi is hunting an outlaw. Since Angulamala was born with bad omens, they conclude it must be him. Although the father prefers not to interfere, the mother disagrees. Fearing for her son's life, she sets out to find her son, warn him of the king's intent and take care of him. The Buddha perceives through meditative vision Pali, Avana, that Angulamala has slain 999 victims, and is desperately seeking a thousandth. If the Buddha is to encounter Angulamala that day, the latter will become a monk and subsequently attain Avana. However, if Angulamala is to kill his mother instead, she will be his thousandth victim and he will be unsavable, since matricide in Buddhism is considered one of the five worst actions a person can commit. The Buddha sets off to intercept Angulamala, despite being warned by local villagers not to go. On the road through the forest of Kosala, Angulamala first sees his mother. According to some versions of the story, he then has a moment of reconciliation with her, she providing food for him. After some deliberation, however, he decides to make her his thousandth victim. But then when the Buddha also arrives, he chooses to kill him instead. He draws his sword, and starts running towards the Buddha. But although Angulamala is running as fast as he can, he cannot catch up with the Buddha who is walking calmly. The Buddha is using some supernatural accomplishment Pali, IDDHI, Sanskrit, RDD, that affects Angulamala. One text states the Buddha through these powers contracts and expands the earth on which they stand, thus keeping a distance of Angulamala. This bewilders Angulamala so much that he calls to the Buddha to stop. The Buddha then says that he himself has already stopped, and that it is Angulamala who should stop. I, Angulamala, am standing still, Pali, Tita, having for all beings laid aside the rod, Pali, Danda, but you are unrestrained, Pali, Asanato, regarding creatures, therefore, I am standing still, you are not standing still. Angulamala asks for further explanation, after which the Buddha says that a good monk should control his desires. Angulamala is impressed by the Buddha's courage, and struck with guilt about what he has done. After listening to the Buddha, Angulamala reverently declares himself converted, vows to cease his life as a brigand and joins the Buddhist monastic order. He is admitted in the Jetavana Monastery. Life as a monk and death 
Meanwhile, King Pasanadi sets out to kill Angulamala. He stops first to pay a visit to the Buddha and his followers at the Jetavana Monastery. He explains to the Buddha his purpose, and the Buddha asks how the king will respond if he were to discover that Angulamala had given up the life of a highwayman and become a monk. The king says that he would salute him and offer to provide for him in his monastic vocation. The Buddha then reveals that Angulamala is sitting only a few feet away, his hair and beard shaven off, a member of the Buddhist order. The king, astounded but also delighted, addresses Angulamala by his clan and mother's name Pali, Gagamantaniputta, and offers to donate robe materials to Angulamala. Angulamala, however, does not accept the gift, because of an ascetic training he observes. In the end, the king chooses not to persecute Angulamala. This passage would agree with Buddhologist Andre Barrow's observation that there was an unwritten agreement of mutual non interference between the Buddha and kings and rulers of the time. Later, Angulamala comes across a young woman undergoing difficult labor during a childbirth. Angulamala is profoundly moved by this, and understands pain and feels compassion to an extent he did not know when he was still a brigand. He goes to the Buddha and asks him what he can do to ease her pain. The Buddha tells Angulamala to go to the woman and say, Sister, since I was born, I do not recall that I have ever intentionally deprived a living being of life. By this truth, may you be well and may your infant be well. Angulamala points out that it would be untrue for him to say this, to which the Buddha responds with this revised stanza, Sister, since I was born with noble birth, I do not recall that I have ever intentionally deprived a living being of life. By this truth, may you be well and may your infant be well. Emphasis added The Buddha is here drawing Angulamala's attention to his choice of having become a monk, describing this as a second birth that contrasts with his previous life as a brigand. Jati means birth, but the word is also glossed in the Pali commentaries as clan or lineage Pali, gotta. Thus, the word jati here also refers to the lineage of the Buddhas, i.e. the monastic community, after Angulamala makes this act of truth. The woman safely gives birth to her child. This verse later became one of the protective verses, commonly called the Angulamala Parita. Monastics continue to recite the text during blessings for pregnant women in Theravada countries, and often memorize it as part of monastic training. Thus, Angulamala is widely seen by devotees as the patron saint of childbirth. Changing from a murderer to a person seen to ensure safe childbirth has been a huge transformation. This event helps Angulamala to find peace. After performing the act of truth, he is seen to bring life rather than death to the townspeople and people start to approach him and provide him with alms food, however, a resentful few cannot forget that he was responsible for the deaths of their loved ones. With sticks and stones they attack him as he walks for alms. With a bleeding head, torn outer robe and a broken alms bowl, Angulamala manages to return to the monastery. The Buddha encourages Angulamala to bear his torment with equanimity, he indicates that Angulamala is experiencing the fruits of the karma that would otherwise have condemned him to hell. Having become an enlightened disciple, Angulamala remains firm and invulnerable in mind. 
According to Buddhist teachings, enlightened disciples cannot create any new karma, but they may still be subject to the effects of old karma that they once did. The effects of his karma are inevitable, and even the Buddha cannot stop them from occurring. After having admitted Angulamala in the monastic order, the Buddha issues a rule that from now on, no criminals should be accepted as monks in the order. Buddhahosa states that Angulamala dies shortly after becoming a monk. After his death, a discussion arises among the monks as to what Angulamala's afterlife destination is. When the Buddha states that Angulamala has attained nirvana, this surprises some monks. They wonder how it is possible for someone who killed so many people to still attain enlightenment. The Buddha responds that even after having done much evil, a person still has a possibility to change for the better and attain enlightenment. <laughs> Analysis Historical <laughs> 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 The custom of the giving of goodbye gifts to one's teacher was customary in ancient India. There is an example in the ''Book of Porsia'' of the Vedic epic Mahabharata. Here the teacher sends his disciple Uttanka away after Uttanka has proven himself worthy of being trustworthy and in the possession of all the Vedic and Dharmashastric teachings. Uttanka says to his teacher, What can I do for you that pleases you? Sanskrit, Kim T. Priyam Karavani, because thus it is said, whoever answers without being in agreement with the Dharma, and whoever asks without being in agreement with the Dharma, either occurs, one dies, or one attracts animosity. Indologist Friedrich Wilhelm maintains that similar phrases already occur in the Book of Manu 2, 111, and in the Institutes of Vishnu. By taking leave of their teacher and promising to do whatever their teacher asks of them, brings, according to the Vedic teachings, enlightenment or a similar attainment. It is therefore not unusual that Angulamala is described to do his teacher's horrible bidding—although being a good and kind person at heart—in the knowledge that in the end he will reap the highest attainment. Indologist Richard Gombrich has postulated that the story of Angulamala may be a historical encounter between the Buddha and a follower of an early Saivite or Shakti form of Tantra. Gombrich reaches this conclusion on the basis of a number of inconsistencies in the texts that indicate possible corruption, and the fairly weak explanations for Angulamala's behavior provided by the commentators. He notes that there are several other references in the early Pali canon that seem to indicate the presence of devotees of Saiva, Kali, and other divinities associated with sanguinary violent tantric practices. The textual inconsistencies discovered could be explained through this theory. The idea that Angulamala was part of a violent cult was already suggested by the Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang (602–64 CE). In his travel accounts, Xuanzang states that Angulamala's was taught by his teacher that he would be born in the Brahma heaven if he killed a Buddha. A Chinese early text gives a similar description, stating that Angulamala's teacher followed the gruesome instructions of his guru, to attain immortality. Xuanzang's suggestion was further developed by European translators of Xuanzang's travel accounts in the early 20th century, but partly based on translation errors. 
Regardless, Gombrich is the first recent scholar to postulate this idea. However, Gombrich's claim that tantric practices existed before the finalization of the canon of Buddhist discourses two to three centuries BCE goes against mainstream scholarship. Scholarly consensus places the arising of the first tantric cults about a thousand years later, and no corroborating evidence has been found, whether textual or otherwise, of earlier sanguinary tantric practices. Though Gombrich argues that there are other, similar antinomian practices going against moral norms which are only mentioned once in Buddhist scriptures and for which no evidence can be found outside of the scriptures, Buddhist studies scholars Mudagamua and von Rospat dismiss these as incorrect examples. They also take issue with Gombrich's metrical arguments, thus disagreeing with Gombrich's hypotheses with regard to angular mala. They do consider it possible, however, that angular mala's violent practices were part of some kind of historical cult. Buddhist studies scholar L. S. Cousins has also expressed doubts about Gombrich's theory. In the Chinese translation of the Dhammakavadana by Hui Qiao, as well as in archaeological findings, Angular Mala is identified with the mythological Hindu king Kalmashapada or Saudasa, known since Vedic times. Ancient texts often describe Saudasa's life as Angular Mala's previous life, and both characters deal with the problem of being a good Brahmin. Studying art depictions in the Gandhara region, archaeologist Maurizio Tade theorizes that the story of Angular Mala may point at an Indian mythology with regard to a yaksa living in the wild. In many depictions Angular Mala is wearing a headdress, which Tade describes as an example of Dionysian-like iconography. Art historian Pia Brancaccio argues, however, that the headdress is an Indian symbol used for figures associated with the wild or hunting. She concurs with Tade that depictions of Angular Mala, especially in Gandhara, are in many ways reminiscent of Dionysian themes in Greek art and mythology, and influence is highly likely. However, Brancaccio argues that the headdress was essentially an Indian symbol, used by artists to indicate Angular Mala belonged to a forest tribe, feared by the early Buddhists who were mostly urban. Doctrinal <inaudible> 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 Among Buddhists, Angular Mala is one of the most well-known stories. Not only in modern times, in ancient times, two important Chinese pilgrims traveling to India reported about the story, and reported about the places they visited that were associated with Angular Mala's life. From a Buddhist perspective, Angular Mala's story serves as an example that even the worst of people can overcome their faults and return to the right path. The commentaries uphold the story as an example of good karma destroying evil karma. Buddhists widely regard Angular Mala as a symbol of complete transformation and as a showcase that the Buddhist path can transform even the least likely initiates. Buddhists have raised Angular Mala's story as an example of the compassion Pali, karuna, and supernatural accomplishment Pali, I -D -D -H -I, of the Buddha. Angular Mala's conversion is cited as a testimony to the Buddha's capabilities as a teacher, and as an example of the healing qualities of the teaching of the Buddha Dharma. .Through his reply, the Buddha connects the notion of refraining from harming Pali, avahimsa with stillness, which is the cause and effect of not harming. 
Furthermore, the story illustrates that there is spiritual power in such stillness, as the Buddha is depicted as outrunning the violent Angulamala. Though this is explained as being the result of the Buddha's supernatural accomplishment, the deeper meaning is that the spiritually still person can move faster than the conventionally active person. In other words, spiritual achievement is only possible through non-violence. Furthermore, this stillness refers to the Buddhist notion of liberation from karma, as long as one cannot escape from the endless law of karmic retribution, one can at least lessen one's karma by practicing non-violence. The texts describe this as form of stillness, as opposed to the continuous movement of karmic retribution. topic in behavioral sciences the story of angulamala illustrates how criminals are affected by their psychosocial and physical environment jungian analyst dale mathers theorizes that ahimsaka started to kill because his meaning system had broken down he was no longer appreciated as an academic talent. His attitude could be summarized as, I have no value, therefore I can kill. If I kill, then that proves I have no value. Summarizing the life of Angulamala, Mathers writes, H. E. is a figure who bridges giving and taking life. Similarly, referring to the psychological concept of moral injury, theologian John Thompson describes Angulamala as someone who is betrayed by an authority figure but manages to recover his eroded moral code and repair the community he has affected. Survivors of moral injury need a clinician and a community of people that face struggles together but deal with those in a safe way. Similarly, Angulamala is able to recover from his moral injury due to the Buddha as his spiritual guide, and a monastic community that leads a disciplined life, tolerating hardship. Thompson has further suggested Angulamala's story might be used as a sort of narrative therapy and describes the ethics presented in the narrative as inspiring responsibility. The story is not about being saved, but rather saving oneself with help from others. Ethics scholar David Loy has written extensively about Angulamala's story and the implications it has for the justice system. He believes that in Buddhist ethics, the only reason offenders should be punished is to reform their character. If an offender, like Angulamala, has already reformed himself, there is no reason to punish him, even as a deterrent. Furthermore, Loy argues that the story of Angulamala does not include any form of restorative or transformative justice, and therefore considers the story, "...flawed", as an example of justice. Former politician and community health scholar Mathura Shrestha, on the other hand, describes Angulamala's story as P. Robably the first concept of transformative justice. Citing Angulamala's repentance and renunciation of his former life as a brigand, and the pardon he eventually receives from relatives of victims. Writing about capital punishment, scholar Damien Horrigan notes that rehabilitation is the main theme of Angulamala's story, and that witnessing such rehabilitation is the reason why King Pasanadi does not persecute Angulamala. In Sri Lankan pre birth rituals, when the Angulamala Sutta is chanted for a pregnant woman, it is custom to surround her with objects symbolizing fertility and 
reproduction, such as parts of the coconut tree and earthen pots. Scholars have pointed out that in Southeast Asian mythology, there are links between bloodthirsty figures and fertility motifs. The shedding of blood can be found in both violence and childbirth, which explains why Angulimala is both depicted as a killer and a healer with regard to childbirth. With regard to the passage when the Buddha meets Angulimala, feminist scholar Liz Wilson concludes that the story is an example of cooperation and interdependence between the sexes. Both the Buddha and Angulimala's mother helped to stop him. Similarly, Thompson argues that mothers play an important role in the story, also citing the passage of the mother trying to stop Angulamala, as well as Angulamala healing a mother giving childbirth. Furthermore, both the Buddha and Angulamala take on motherly roles in the story. Although many ancient Indian stories associate women with qualities like foolishness and powerlessness, Angulamala's story accepts feminine qualities, and the Buddha acts as a wise advisor to use those qualities in a constructive way. Nevertheless, Thompson does not consider the story feminist in any way, but does argue it contains a feminine kind of ethics of care, rooted in Buddhism. In modern culture Throughout Buddhist history, Angulimala's story has been depicted in many art forms, some of which can be found in museums and Buddhist heritage sites. In modern culture, Angulimala still plays an important role. In 1985, the British-born Theravada monk Ajahn Kimadamo founded Angulimala, a Buddhist prison chaplaincy organisation in the UK. It has been recognised by the British government as the official representative of the Buddhist religion in all matters concerning the British prison system, and provides chaplains, counselling services, and instruction in Buddhism and meditation to prisoners throughout England, Wales, and Scotland. The name of the organization refers to the power of transformation illustrated by Angulimala's story. According to the website of the organization, "...the story of Angulimala teaches us that the possibility of enlightenment may be awakened in the most extreme of circumstances." that people can and do change and that people are best influenced by persuasion and above all, example." In popular culture, Angulimala's legend has received considerable attention. The story has been the main subject of at least three movies. In 2003, Thai director Southup Tanarat attempted to release a film named Angulimala. Over 20 conservative Buddhist organizations in Thailand launched a protest, however, complaining that the movie distorted Buddhist teachings and history, and introduced Hindu and theistic influences not found in the Buddhist scriptures. The Thai Film Censorship Board rejected appeals to ban the film, stating it did not distort Buddhist teachings. They did insist that the director cut two scenes of violent material. The conservative groups were offended by the depiction of Angulimala as a brutal murderer, without including the history which led him to become such a violent brigand. Tanarat defended himself, however, arguing that although he had omitted interpretations from the commentaries, he had followed the early Buddhist discourses precisely. Tanarat's choice to only use the early accounts, rather than the popular tales from the commentaries, was precisely what led to the protests. Angulimala has also been the subject of literary works. 
In 2006, peace activist Satish Kumar retold the story of Angular Mala in his short book The Buddha and the Terrorist. The book deals with the global war on terror, reshaping and combining various accounts of Angular Mala, who is described as a terrorist. The book emphasizes the passage when the Buddha accepts Angular Mala in the monastic order, effectively preventing King Pasanadi from punishing him. In Kumar's book, this action leads to backlash from an enraged public, who demand to imprison both Angular Mala and the Buddha. Pasanadi organizes a public trial in the presence of villagers and the royal court, in which the assembly can decide what to do with the two accused. In the end, however, the assembly decides to release the two, when Angulamala admits to his crimes and Pasanadi gives a speech emphasizing forgiveness rather than punishment. This twist in the story sheds a different light on Angular Mala, whose violent actions ultimately lead to the trial and a more non-violent and just society. Writing about Buddhist texts and Kumar's book, Thompson reflects that ahimsa in Buddhism may have different shades of meaning in different contexts, and often does not mean passively standing by, or non-violence as usually understood. <laughs> Notes <laughs>